Hi friends, welcome to Krakow's video series. I'm Saili Kale. I'm one of the founders of Krakow and an alumna of IIM Ahmedabad. In this particular video, we'll be discussing all the DILR sets from CAT 2021 from slot 3. So all of those sets have been discussed in detail in this particular video. If you're looking for free mocks to prepare for CAT, please do check out our description box. We have given the links to three free mocks in the description box. Apart from that, while you're preparing for CAT, we strongly recommend that you see all the CAT previous year's papers. Krakow has put up all the CAT previous year's papers, both in the PDF format, which you can download, or you can take them in actual mock format, which is recommended because then you'll get actual ex exam experience as such. So apart from that, please do also check out our formula sheets. We have formula PDFs which encompass all the formulas that you will need for cracking cat. So please do check out our description box for all these free resources that you can use to crack cat. Thank you and please keep watching. In this question, we are told that there are some bottles and each of them contain 50 ml of liquid. They can be either 100% pure or they can contain some impurity. We are told that once some testing is done, if you take some samples from some bottles and do testing, if the percentage of impurity is greater than 10%, then it will detect impurity. If it is not greater than or equal to 10%, say the percentage impurity is say 8%, then the test will not detect any impurity. Now let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. Five ml of content from bottle A is mixed with five ml of content from bottle B. So A and B have equal content. Both of them are mixed. The resultant mixture, when tested, detects the presence of impurity I. This would imply that the overall percentage of impurity, when both of them are mixed in equal proportion, is greater than or equal to ten percent. It is known that A contains only P, or the percentage of impurity in A is zero percent. If the average impurity in A and B when they are mixed in equal quantities is greater than or equal to 10%, if A contains 0% impurity, it would imply that the percentage impurity in B has to be greater than or equal to 20%. Only then will when you are combining both of them in equal quantities will the average percentage of impurity be greater than or equal to 10%. We are required to calculate what best can be concluded about the volume of impurity in bottle B. It is given that each of the bottles contains 50 ml of liquid and the percentage of impurity in B is greater than or equal to 20%. So the volume of impurity in bottle B is greater than or equal to 20% of 50 ml which is equal to 10 ml. So the impurity is greater than or equal to 10 ml which is option D. Let us now look at the next question. We are told that there are four bottles and each of the bottle is either completely pure or completely impure. Now we are required to dispatch them or we they will be considered to be ready for dispatch only if they are all completely pure. So how many tests are required to determine whether they are collectively ready for dispatch or not. Now let us consider some cases. In the first case, all the four bottles are completely pure. In the second case, three bottles are completely pure and one bottle is impure. In the third case, two bottles are pure and two bottles are impure. In the fourth case, one bottle is pure and three bottles are impure. In the last case, all the four bottles are impure. Now, if you are doing a test where you are taking a small sample from each of the four of them and you are testing whether there is impurity or purity. In the last case, the test is going to determine that it is impure. Because the percentage impurity in this particular case will be 100%. In the earlier case, the percentage impurity will be 75%. So when a test is done by taking small samples from each one of them, it will be determined to be impure. In the third case, if two bottles are pure and two bottles are impure, the percentage impurity, if you are mixing equal quantities from each of the four bottles will be 50%. So the test will again determine that this is impure. In the second case, if you are mixing equal quantities from each of the four bottles, the percentage impurity will be 25%. So the test is going to determine that this is impure. In the first case, when all the four bottles are completely pure, we have 0% impurity. And so the test is going to determine it is pure. So if the test returns that the sample collected is pure, only then is it completely ready for dispatch. In all the other cases, it is not completely ready for dispatch. So by conducting just one test, we can immediately identify 
whether this uh, sample of four bottles is ready for dispatch or not. So, the correct answer is one test is sufficient. Let us look at the next case. We are told that there are four bottles. It is known that three of the bottles contain only P. So, we have three P and one I but the fourth one let us say is P star because this contains 80 percent pure sample and 20 percent impurity. Now, we are required to find out which one is P star that is which one is the bottle which is not 100 percent pure amongst the four bottles. We are required to do it in minimum number of tests that is required. Now, if you are mixing three bottles, one of them is P star and the remaining two are completely P. In that overall sample, what is the percentage of impurity? That will be 20 percent divided by 3 which is equal to 6.67 percent. This is less than 10 percent. So, if you are mixing three bottles or four bottles, your test itself becomes completely untrustworthy because even if there is some impurity because it is less than 10 percent, we will not be able to determine whether it is actually pure or impure. So, we should mix only at max two bottles. One easiest way, very inefficient way of uh, testing and finding out which one of them is the impure bottle is by taking a small sample from each one of them and measuring them independently. So, within four tries, you will figure out which of the bottle contains impurity. But that is inefficient, we can improve upon it. How are you going to improve upon it? We will mix two bottles, two samples from the first and the second bottle, small samples of equal volume and we will mix small samples from equal volume from 3 and 4 also. We will first test 1 and 2. If 1 and 2 contains P star, that is if one of the two bottles actually contains some impurity because the impurity is 20 percent in that bottle individually, in this sample the percentage impurity will be 10 percent. So, immediately the test is going to determine that okay there is some impurity. So, with one test we can identify that okay the impurity is lying either in bottle 1 or bottle 2. Then we will check bottle 1 separately and we will identify if it is impure, if the test is written impure then the impurity is in bottle 1, if the test is written pure then the impurity is in bottle 2. So, by doing two tests we can easily identify which bottle the impurity is present in. But suppose in the first case, suppose in the first case when you are testing a sample of 1 and 2, so you have done one test and this returns pure, then it is imperative that bottle 1 and bottle 2 are 100% pure. So, the impurity is either in 3 or in bottle 4. Now, test a small sample from bottle 3. If it returns pure, then you can say that the impurity is in bottle 4. If it returns impure, then obviously the impurity is in bottle 3. So, again even in this case, just by conducting two tests, we can identify which of the four bottles contains that impurity. Let us now look at the last question. There are four bottles. It is known that out of these four bottles, either one bottle is pure and three bottles are impure or two bottles are pure and two bottles are impure. One of these two cases is true and whenever there is impurity, that impurity contains 85 percent pure and 15 percent impure. Now, let us mix equal quantities from each of the four bottles. And what is the percentage impurity in the first case? In the first case, P will give 0 percent impurity. The remaining 3 will give 15 percent impurity. So, the average impurity in the sample will be whole of this divided by 4 which is equal to 45 percent divided by 4 which is 10, 11.25 percent. So, in the first case, if there is only one pure bottle and three bottles which are impure containing 15 percent impurity. If you are mixing equal quantities from each of the four bottles, the percentage impurity will be 11.25 percent. Now, if you are conducting a test, purity test on this sample, it will return impure. In the second case, suppose at the start there were two bottles which are pure and two bottles which are impure. What is the percentage impurity in the sample? It will be 0 percent in the first bottle plus 0 percent in the second bottle plus 15 percent in the third bottle plus 15 percent in the fourth bottle divided by 4. This will be equal to 7.5 percent. Now, because this is less than the threshold of 10 percent, when a test is done, this is going to return that the sample is completely pure. So, if you are trying to figure out whether the initial sample has one bottle pure or two bottles pure, what we need to do is collect equal amount of uh, liquid, small amount of liquid from each of the four bottles and conduct a test. If the test returns pure, then it is case 2. 
it would imply that at the start there were two bottles which are pure. If the test returns impure, then it would imply that it is the first case where there is only one bottle which is pure. So, this would uh, imply that just by conducting one test, we can figure out whether at the start there was one bottle which was pure or two bottles which was pure. So, the required answer is only one test is needed. Google search Krako free cat mocks. Click on the first link. You can attempt three latest cat mocks in the actual exam interface. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis, percentile, along with your scorecard to gauge your all India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. In this question, we are given a chart which uh, tells us the amount of work done across five different projects by four different people. The names of the people are A, B, D and T. So, let us first put this data in a table and then we can go ahead and answer the questions that follow. The table will have uh, information about the five projects and by the four people. So, it will be a, the number of uh, columns will be equal to five and the number of rows will be equal to four. So, it will look something like this. This is project 1, this is project 2, this is project 3, this is project 4 and this is project 5. This is the work done by A, B, D and T. If you are looking at the first project, the first project uh, A and B worked for 2 months each and both of them finished 100%. So, we will put 2 over here and we will put 100%. B also worked for 2 months and again he completed 100%. T worked for 2 months and he completed 80%. So, this is 2 and 100%. Similarly, let us do this for the remaining 4 projects also. In project 2, D and T worked. T again worked for 2 months and completed 100%. While D worked for 3 months and completed 90%. Let us now look at project 3. A, B and D worked. A worked for 2 months and completed 100%. B worked for 1, 2, 3, 4 months and he completed 75%. And D worked for 3 months and completed 100%. Next let us look at project 4. A worked for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 months and completed 80%. D worked for 2 months and completed 100%. T worked for 3 months and completed 100%. For project 5, B worked for 3 months and he completed 90%. Sorry, this is not A, this is B. D worked for 1 month and completed 100% and T worked for 2 months and completed 100%. We have been given some information which describes uh, certain uh, heuristics like uh, completion percentage, completion index, project months, all of these things are given. But we will calculate them only if they are actually needed. There is no reason to actually calculate all of these indexes for all the four people across the five projects uh, before we actually look at what the questions are. So, let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. We are given two statements. The total project month was the same for the four employees. Project month is the number of months that each of the four people have worked, the total number of uh, months. So, if you are calculating the project month for A, it is 2 plus 2 plus 5 which is 9. For B, it is 2 plus 4 plus 3 which is again equal to 9. For D, it is 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1, which is 9. And for T, it is 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2, which is also equal to 9. So, the first statement is correct. Let us look at the second statement. The total employee month. Employee month is the total number of employee months that were uh, used for each of the project. For example, for P1, it will be 2 plus 2 plus 2, which is 6. For P2, it is 3 plus 2, which is 5. For P3, it is 2 plus 4 plus 3, which is 9. And for P4, it is 5 plus 2 plus 3, which is 10. And for P5, it is 3 plus 1 plus 2, which is 6. Now, clearly you can see that the 
project months are the same but the employee months are different so statement 2 is not correct and the correct answer is only one let us look at the next statement which employees did not work in multiple projects for any of the month in 2020 let us look at the graph again here is the graph did a work in multiple months you can see that a worked in the first uh, project in february and march in the second in project he did not work in the third project he worked in may and june in the fourth project he worked from july till uh, november so a did not work in any of the projects simultaneously any two projects it did not work simultaneously if you are looking at b b worked in the first project uh, in february and march in the second project he also did not work in the third project he worked from april to august and in the fifth project he worked from october to december so b also did not work simultaneously in any given month across two projects if you are looking at d d worked uh, from February to April in the first in the second project then he worked from June to August in the fourth project he worked from September to October in the fourth project and from December he worked in the last project so even though he worked in uh, four different projects there was never any overlap between any of the projects let us now look at T T worked in the first project from January and February in the second project he worked in March and uh, April in the fourth project he worked from July to September end and in the fifth project he worked from September till October end so you can see that here there is an overlap where T was working in project 4 and project 5 so the employees who did not work on multiple projects in any of the months is A, B and D so the correct answer is option A let us look at the next question. The project duration measured in terms of the number of months is the time during which at least one employee worked in the project. Which of the following projects had the same uh, project duration? Let us calculate it for each of the five projects. This is P1, P2, P3, P4 and P5. The project duration of uh, project 1 is from January till March so it is 3 for project 2 it is from February 1st till April end so again it is 3 months for project 3 it is from April 1st to August end so that is April May June July and August so it is 5 months for project 5 it is from July 1st to November end so that is July, August, September, October and November. So again it is 5 months. And for uh, project 5 it is from September 1st to December end. So it is September, October, November and December. So it is 4 months. So the project duration is the same for P1 and P2 as well as for P3 and P4. Any one of the two will be the correct answer. You can see that P1 and P2 is not given in the options. So the correct option we have to select is option D. Let us look at the last question. The list of employees in decreasing order of the annual completion index. So for each of the four employees we have to calculate the completion index. For A it will be 2 into 100 percent plus 2 into 100 percent plus 5 into 80 percent divided by 9. For B, it will be 2 into 100% plus 4 into 75% plus 3 into 90% divided by the total months which is the same for all of them actually, it is 9. For D, it is 3 into 90% plus 3 into 100% plus 2 into 100% plus 1 into 100% divided by 9. And for T it is 2 into 100% plus 2 into 100% plus 3 into 100%. Let us look at uh, T again because I think there is a mistake. I don't think anyone has worked at 100% uh, all throughout. Project 1 you have to remember we made a mistake. 
we have to correct that project 1 t worked at 80 percent so these are the kind of things which uh, should strike you when you are uh, inputting it you should remember that is it really true that uh, t worked at 100 percent across all the projects so when it uh, looks suspicious you should again cross check so here it is 2 into 80 percent plus 2 into 100 percent plus 3 into 100 percent plus 2 into 100 percent divided by again 9. If you are simplifying for each one of them for A it is 200, 200 and 400. So that is 800 by 9 percent. For B it is 200 plus 300 is 500 plus 270 is 770. It is 770 percent by 9. For D it is 3 into 90 is 270 plus 300, 200, 100. So, that is 600. So, this is 870 by 9 percent. And finally, for T, this is 2 into 80 is 160 plus 200, 300 and 200. So, that is 700. So, this is 860 by 9 percent. So, if you are looking at the decreasing order, D is greater than, T is greater than, A is greater than B. So, the correct answer will be D, T, A, B, D, T, A, B, option C. We at Traku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MB examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question, we are told that there are 10 players P1, P2, P3, dot, 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 till P10 who competed in a javelin event. The javelin event is divided into two phases. There is phase 1 and there is phase 2. We have been given some information and using this information, we are required to calculate uh, what are the scores of each uh, person in each of these rounds. Now, the most important thing in this is to first figure out the order in which each of these javelin throwers are throwing in all the six rounds. The order for the first round is very easy. The order for the first round will be like this. First there will be P1 because nobody has thrown till now. They will throw according to the seedings. Then it will be P2. Then it is P3. Then P4. P5. P6. P7. P8. P9. And P10. This is for the first round. The order for the second round is also easy to calculate because we are given their scores in the first round. So, if you are looking at the order of the second round, whichever person has gotten the highest in the first round is going to throw first. Who has gotten the highest in the first round? That is P7. So, P7 will throw first and the second highest will throw next. That is P5. Then we have the third highest who is P9. Then we have uh, P1. Next, we will have P6. Then we have P3. All the others had invalid throws in the first round. So, they will throw in the order of their original seedings. So, the highest seed who got a 0 in the first round is P2 who will throw next. Then it is P4. And finally, it is P8 and P10. Now, the order, uh, this is how the order of the throws will be there for the second round. What about the third round? For the third round, we need to have an idea about how people performed in the second round to get an idea of the order in which they threw in the third round. For that, we have been given some information. We are told that among the second round, only the last two were valid. That is, only P8 and P10 improved their scores in the second round. Everyone else would not improve their scores. And we are also told that both of these players qualified for the second phase. So, both of them came in the top six. And one of them finished with the least score in the first round. So, this would imply that if you draw a line over here as top 6, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. P8 and P10 finished above this. Uh, so, when the third round actually started because their scores have improved and they reached the top 6, they would be 
over here. We don't exactly know where they are, but we know that they will be in the top six. For the remaining people, the order would not be affected. So we know that P7 would throw, P5 would throw next, P9 would throw next, P1 would throw next. This is 1, 2, 3, 4. And P6 would come after the top six. So P6 would come over here, then P3, then P2 and P4. This is the order in which they threw in the third round. And in the third round, again, the scores are given to us. If you notice, there is only one player who improved his score. And that player is P1. The score of P3 in the third round was 79. But his score in the first round is 81.5, which is higher. So this is basically a redundant throw. It hasn't improved his score or his standings. Same is the case for even P9. He scored 81.4. But in the first round, he scored 84.1. So again, this is a redundant throw. It doesn't really matter. The only person whose seating has improved as a result of the throws in the third round is P1. So at the end of the third round, the standings as they are would be something like this. P1 would be at the top. After P1, we have P7. P1, P7, P5 and P9. Notice that we are not saying anything about P8 and P10. We don't really know where they are placed. What we know for sure about P8 and P10 is that one of them will be at the bottom. He is the sixth person over here and the other person will be somewhere at the top. He can be either first or second or third or fourth or even fifth. But one of them will be sixth. And the people who are uh, who haven't qualified for the next round, that can be confirmed. They will be P6, P3, P2 and P4. These are the people who are not qualified. This is the information that we know as far as the first phase is concerned. Before we actually go to the second phase, if you are looking at the clues that are given, we will be able to figure out the order in which these guys have actually performed. How can we actually figure it out? Because we are told that if there is a player who throws last in one round and first in another round, he is called, uh, he, is, he gets a double. And there are two players who got a double. Let us try to figure out how this double is actually happening. Was there any double in the first round that is between the first and the second rounds? The player who threw last in the first round, we know for sure is Peter. And we also know that the player who threw first in the second round is P7. So there is no double between the first and the second rounds. Is there any double between the second and the third rounds? The person who threw last in the second round is P10. And the person who threw first in the third round can be either P7 or it is one of P8 or P10. Because we know that one of P8 or P10 has finished sixth and the other person can finish anywhere in the top five. We don't know where exactly has finished. So there is a possibility that the, a double can happen in between the second and the third rounds if it is P10. We'll put a question mark over here because we are not sure whether P10 actually finished at the top of the standings at the end of the second round. If you are looking at between the third and the fourth rounds, the person who finished at the end of the third and the fourth round is either P8 or P10. Because we know that one of these two was the has qualified for the second round with the least score. And remember that between the fourth, fifth and the sixth rounds, that is in the second phase, the person with the least standings actually throws first. In the first phase, the person with the highest score throws first. That is the top seed at that uh, round throws first. In the second phase, the person with the least score throws first. So if say at the end of the first phase, that is at the end of the third round and the, the beginning of the fourth round, we have somebody who has the highest score. Then they will have people with lesser scores and we will have somebody with the lowest score. Now, the person with the lowest score is going to throw first. So, definitely in the third round, we have somebody who has the lowest score who will throw last. And at the start of the second phase, that is in the fourth round, that person is going to throw first. So, definitely there is a double between the third and the fourth rounds. Now, who got the double? We don't know. It can be either P8 or P10. Now, can there be a double between the fourth and the fifth rounds and the fifth and the sixth rounds? For this to happen in the second phase, Somebody who has the highest score at the start of a particular round becomes the lowest score person. Can this happen in the second round? It can definitely happen. But how? Uh, what is required for that to happen? The person with the lowest score has to jump above the person with the highest score. Same is the case for even the second lowest, third lowest, fourth lowest and the person with the second round, second highest. So if all of these guys, that is if five people improve their scores and jump above the highest uh, scoring person, then this guy who will throw last in the fourth round on the basis of the fact that he has the highest score till then suddenly becomes the lowest person at the end of the fourth round and therefore he will throw first. 
then a double is possible. But for that to happen, we need at least 5 people to improve their scores in one particular round. We are told that in the second phase, there are only 3 people who improved uh, their scores. Because in each round of the second phase, exactly one person has improved his score. There was no round in which 5 people have improved their scores. So a double cannot happen between the 4th and the 5th round or between the 5th and the 6th rounds. Because the number of people who improved their scores was not 5 in any round. In fact, in each of the second phase rounds, only one person has improved his score. And if you are told that a total of two doubles happened, then it is imperative that P10 got his double between the second and the third round. That is, at the start of the second round, he was last. But at the end of the second round, he was first. So this would imply that at the start of the third round, P10 was over here. This would imply that P8 was over here. And therefore, the final standings, P10 is either above P1 or he is below P1. Why can we not uh, say for sure where he was at the end of the third round? We can't say that uh, because we know that P10 score is greater than P7 score. We know the scores of P7. P7 got uh, 87.2 and he ended up at that uh, score at the end of the first round. Because we know who has improved his scores in the first round, second round and third round. P7 scored 87.2 in the first round and he just stayed there. P10 got a double, so P10 ended up being higher than P7. But P10's comparison with respect to P1 cannot be made for sure. What we know for sure is that P10 was at the top of the standings at the start of the third round. But P1 has improved his standings and he jumped over P7. But did he jump over P10 also? That we are not so sure. So we will have two cases. In one case, P10 is at the top of the standings at the end of the third round. Or P10 is uh, second because P1 jumped even above P10 with his uh, throw of 88.6. But the relative standings of everyone else is known. P10 is either above P1, then we are going to get P1, then P10 might come uh, below P1, this two is uncertain. Then we will have P7, P5, P9, P8, P6, P3, P2 and P4, these guys are disqualified. They did not uh, qualify for the second phase. Now let us look at the second phase. In the second phase, let us do it over here so that there is no confusion. Let us consider both the cases. In the first case, P10 is at the top of the standings. Then we have P1, then P7, then P5, P9 and P8. This is one case. In this case, P1 improved his score in the third round, but he was not able to score higher than P10. P10 was at the top of the standings at the start of the third round. In the second case, P1 has improved his score even more than P10. P10 was at the top of the standings, but P1 improved his score by a lot and he jumped even above P10. Then we have P10 over here, then P7, P5, P9 and P8. These are the two cases that we have to consider. What is the information that is given to us about the second round? We are told that exactly one person improved his score in the second round in each round of the second phase. And we also know that P10 did not get a medal. So, if P10 entered the second phase as the top scorer and we know that only three people at max have improved their scores because one person has improved in each of the rounds, then it is important that P1, P7 and P5 jumped above P10. We are also told that the person has improved their score by the same amount in each of these improvements. In the fourth round, one person has improved, in the fifth round, one person has improved and in the sixth round, one person has improved. And that measure of improvement in each of these rounds is the same. This would imply that water is the improvement if you are calling that to be i. The final score of P1 will be 88.6 plus i. The final score of P7 will be 87.2 plus i. And the final score of uh, the next highest will be 86.4 plus i. Because the improvement was the same. Now P1 would have won the gold medal. P7 would have won the silver medal and P5 would have won the bronze medal. But the difference between both of them in the first case would be 1.4 because I gets cancelled and in the next case it would be 0.8. But we are told that the difference between the gold medalist and the silver medalist is 1 and the difference between the silver medalist and the bronze medalist is also 1. This would imply that this case is not possible. So at the start of the fourth round, P1 was at the top, P10 was uh, second. P7 was 3rd, P5 was 4th, P9 was 5th and P8 was 6th. In each of the rounds, again exactly one person has improved their scores. Now if the person who has improved their scores 
P1 is definitely a medalist. We don't know which medal he got. This guy is not a medalist. So, we have two medalists amongst P7, P5 and P9. Now, let us try to identify who are the three people who can actually improve their scores. If one of the person who has improved that score is say P1, then it would imply that there are two people amongst P7, P5 and P9 who also improved their scores by the same margin. Again, in the same case like earlier, if you assume that the improvement score is I, P1 would become 88.6 plus I. And then we will have two people amongst P7, P5 and P9. The scores of P9 is 84.1. And each one of them will either have 87.2 plus I and 86.4 plus I and a possibility of 84.1 plus I. But again, the difference between the gold medalist, silver medalist and silver medalist and bronze medalist will not be equal to 1. All of them, the differences are not equal to 1. So, the only case in which this is possible, if you read the phrasing clearly, is that we are told that the gold and the bronze medalist improved their scores in the 5th and the 6th rounds respectively. So, 5th round and 6th round, two people have improved their scores. One medal winner improved his score in the 4th round. Now, if this one medal winner is unique, that is if this guy is say the silver medalist, if uh, three different people have improved their scores, then and because the improvement was constant, you will not get the difference to be exactly equal to 1. What this would imply is that this one medal winner is either the gold medalist or he is the bronze medalist. That is one person has improved his score twice in the second phase and another person has improved his score once. And finally, both of them also have jumped above P10 and become medalists. So, if you are looking at the final standings, P1 cannot improve his score. That is, he cannot be the guy who improved his score two times. And he cannot be the guy who improved his score once. Why is that the case? Because we know that P10 did not win a medal. So, we want two people who are below P10 to actually jump above him. Now, P1 is already above him. And we know that only two people have improved their scores. One person has improved his score by 2i, whatever is that increment. And one person has improved his score by i. Both of them have to come from P7, P5 and P9. Only then will P10 not win a medal. So, one thing we can say for sure is that the final score of P1 is 88.6. We don't know whether he is a gold medalist or whether he is a silver medalist or whether he is a bronze medalist. But we know that P1 ended with 88.6 and he was a medalist. So, let us consider the three cases. The first case is P1 is a gold medalist. The second case is that he is a silver medalist. And the third case is that he is a bronze medalist. Why is this important? This is important because when we are told that gold and silver differ by 1 meter and silver and bronze differ by 1 meter and if you know that one of them is 88.6, we can immediately figure out the standings of the remaining people. In the first case, the gold medalist would win 88.6, the silver medalist would win 87.6 and the bronze medalist would win 86.6. What are the scores of the people before uh, this round has started or before the second phase has started? They were 87.2. Then we have 86.4 and 84.1. If you are looking for a silver medalist who got 87.6, that person clearly has to be 87.2 at the start of the second phase. So, his improvement is 0 0.4. And the guy who ended up with 86.6 has to be 86.4. So, this is 0 0.2. This is matching with one of the requirements that we have. That is, one person has to improve his score by twice as much as the other person. Because one person has improved his score by 0 0.4 and another person improved his score by 0 0.2. So, we are essentially saying that in this case, P1 wins the gold medal. 87.2 that is P7 wins the silver medal. And 86.4 that is P5 wins the bronze medal. This seems to be fine, but there is a contradiction over here. What is the contradiction? The contradiction is that P5 improved his score from 86.4 to 86.6. But we want P7 and P5 both of them to be jumping above P10. We know that at the start of the second phase, P10 was above P7. That is P10 was above 87.2. Now, if P5 ends up with 86.6, yes, he has improved his score by 0 0.2, but he is not going to jump above P10. In this particular case, P10 would be lying somewhere over here. He would be less than 87.6, but it would be greater than 87.2. So, P10 will actually get the bronze medal and not 
this guy P5. So, this case has a contradiction that is not possible. Let us consider the second case. In the second case, P1 won the silver medal. So, he has 88.6. So, the gold medal has to belong to somebody who ended up with 89.6 and the bronze medal will end up with somebody who got 87.6. How is this possible? This is possible only if the 89.6 was by the person who got 87.2. So, his improvement was 2.4 and 87.6 is with the guy who got 86.4. So, his improvement is 1.2. Now, again, this is double, 2.4 is double of 1.2. So, this is working with one of the constraints that we have. This would also tell us that P10 was somewhere over here. That is, P10 was greater than 87.2, but he was less than 87.6. In this case, both P7 as well as P5 jump over P10. Say, if P10 score at the start of the second phase was 87.5 or 87.4 or 87.3, this is valid. And one of this can be true. There is no contradiction apparent over here. If you are looking at the last case, the last case is that P1 won the bronze medal. So, P1 got 88.6. So, the silver medalist got 89.6 and the gold medalist got 90.6. In this case, you will not be able to satisfy the constraint that the improvement of one person is twice the improvement of the other. You can look at different permutations and combinations. You will figure out that nothing actually fits. Just to make uh, one thing clear, say 90.6 was the improvement by 86.4. The improvement will be 4.2. And 89.6 was the improvement by from 87.2. This is 2.4. But 2.4 into 2 is not 4.2. So, and you can look at the other permutations also. You will figure out that there is no way in which you will get a constraint such that the improvement of one person is twice the improvement of the other person. So, the only case that is possible is if P1 wins the silver medal, P7 wins the gold medal and P5 wins the bronze medal. Just to make uh, everything clear, let us actually write down the order in which these guys have actually thrown so that we can then go ahead and answer the questions that follow. In the first round, it is quite clear. Actually, we can write down over here. In the second phase, we will actually make it clear. In the second phase, say, the fourth phase, who was the person who was at the bottom? The person who was at the bottom was P8. So, the person who throws will be P8. He will throw first. The person who was at the second bottom, this is the order, right? The second bottom will be, here will be P10. P10 did not top, that also we have figured out. So, it was something like this. So, the second person would be P9. The third is P5, fourth is P7, fifth is P10 and last is P1. We are told that the person who won the gold medal improved his score in the fifth round and the person who won the bronze medal improved his score in the sixth round. One medal winner improved his score in the fourth round. We now know because the improvement uh, the same improvement that was there in each of the rounds of the second phase is 1.2 that has been figured out because the improvement in the case where P1 won silver from 88.6 was 2.4 in P7 and the improvement for P5 is 1.2. So, the measure of improvement that happened in each of the three rounds is 1.2. So, this would tell us that P7, if you are looking at the scores, P7 was 87.2, now he becomes 87.2 plus 1.2, so he becomes 88.4. This is at the end of the fourth round. P1 was 88.6. P5 was 86.4. P9 and P8 we can ignore because they didn't really win any medal. Now, with this improvement, P7 jumped over P10. So, the order of throwing for the fifth round would be that P8 again was the least, so he threw first, then came P9, then came P5, now P10 comes, P10 is right now third, then P7 throws, P7 right now has 88.4 and P1 has 88.6. Who improved his score in the fifth round? The person who won gold improved his score in the fifth round. So, again P7 improved his score. So, from 88.4, now he jumps to 89.6. So, at the start of the 6th round, he was the 
he was at the top of the standings. So the order of throwing for the sixth round will be that P8 through first, P9 next, P5 next, P10. Now P1 throws and P7 throws because at the start of the sixth round, the best score of P1 is 88.6 and the best score of P7 is 89.6. This is the order of throwing for the sixth round. In this round, the bronze medalist that is P5 jumped above P10. His score was 86.4 at the start of the sixth round, but at the end of the sixth round, it became 87.6. Now, this is how the order of throwing happened in each of the sixth rounds. Let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. Which two players got the double? We have figured out which two players got the double. The double, one of them is P10 and the other is P8. P10 got the double between the second and the third rounds. At the start of the second round, he was the last, but he threw very well. And at the start of the third round, he was the first. So he got the double. P8 was at the last of the people at the end of the third round. But because there was a switch in the ordering, in the second phase, the person who is at the last will throw first. So P10 and P8 got their doubles. Who won the silver medal? The silver medal was won by P1. Who threw the last javelin in the event? The last javelin was thrown by P7. P7 improved his score in the fourth round and in the fifth round. At the end of the fifth round, he was the topper. So he gets to throw last at the in the sixth round. So the correct answer is P7. What was the final score of the silver medalist? The silver medalist was P1. His final score is 88.6. Which of the following can be the final score of P8? What do we know about P8? We know that P8 qualified for the second phase, but he ended up uh, as the last. So, P8, if you are looking at the standings, P8 has to finish above P6. And P8 has to finish below P9. What is the standing of uh, P6? P6 is 82.5. And what is the standing of P9? P9 is 84.1. So what we know is that P8 has to be greater than 82.5. And P8 has to be less than 84.1. This is what we know. 81.9 is less than 82.5 so that is not true 0 is definitely less than 82.5 that also is not true 85.1 is greater than 84.1 so that also is not true the only option which is possible is option c which is 82.7 which will lie between both of these numbers how much did the gold medalist improve his score in the second phase the gold medalist was p7 he ended up with 89.6 he improved his score by 2.4 in the fourth round, he improved his score by 1.2. In the fifth round, he improved his score by 1.2. The bronze medalist improved his score by 1.2 in the sixth round. So overall, the gold medalist improved his score by 2.4, which is option C. Google search Kraku CMAT crash course. Click on the first link. You can find a highly comprehensive crash course curated for the CMAT. Click on enroll to get full access to the course. Hi friends, welcome to Krakos video series. In this particular video, we are going to see a uh, question set, uh, DILR set, which is based on basically selection with conditions. So a few uh, conditions are given and you will be given the result and you have to figure out whether the, uh, how the process essentially works. So let's take a look at the uh, set. Three reviewers, Amal, Bimal and Komal are tasked with selecting questions from a pool of 13 questions, Q01 to Q30. Questions can be created by external subject matter experts, SMEs or one of the three reviewers. Each of the reviewers either approves or disapproves a question that is shown to them. Their decisions lead to eventual acceptance or rejection of the question in the manner described below. So the process is given of the approval uh, as such. If a question is created by an SME, it is reviewed first by Amal, then by Bimal. If both of them approve the question, then the question is accepted and is not reviewed by Komal. If both disapprove the question, then it is rejected and it is not reviewed by Komal. 
If one of them approves the question and the other disapproves it, then the question is reviewed by Kumal. Then the question is accepted only if she approves it. The question created by one of the the questions uh, the, a question created by one of the reviewers is decided upon by the other two. If a question is created by Amal, then it is first reviewed by Bimal. If Bimal approves the question, then it is accepted. Otherwise, it is reviewed by Komal. So, basically, if Amal creates it, then Bimal reviews it. If it is a yes, then it is accepted. If he rejects it, then it goes to Komal. The question is uh, ac then accepted only if Komal approves it. So, if it is made by Amal, Bimal has to accept it. If Bimal rejects, Komal has to accept it. If both of them reject, then the question is rejected. If uh, then further it is given a similar process is followed for questions created by Bimal whose questions are first reviewed by Komal and then by Amal only if Komal disapproves it. So the process is if Bimal creates a question it first go to Komal, if Komal approves it is accepted, if Komal rejects then it goes to Amal, if Amal rejects it it is rejected, if Amal accepts it it is accepted. So one of the other two reviewers also has to accept essentially and there is an order. Amal's goes to Bimal then Komal, Bimal's to Komal and then Amal and from Komal to first Amal and then Bimal. The following facts are also known about the review process. So the, then the following facts are given Q2, Q6, Q9, Q11 and Q12 were rejected and the other questions were accepted. So let's first start by drawing a table. So let us show the table of how many uh, questions there are 13 questions and uh, they were created by these three and finally we have to also see whether they were accepted or rejected and uh, who created the questions essentially. So we will say that we have how many questions? So we have 13 questions as such. So let us draw that out. So you have Q1, Q2, Q3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13. And uh, let us say what is the status whether it is accepted or rejected and we will say how the process went with Amal, Bimal and Komal and who the author was based on this information as such. Now which were uh, accepted and which were rejected so Q2, Q6, Q9, uh, Q11 and Q12 were rejected and everything else was accepted. So let us put the status in first all of these were accepted as such. Amal reviewed only Q2, Q3, Q4, Q6, Q8. So let us mark off all those he did not uh, review at all. 2 to 4 he did. Then uh, 6, 8, 10, Q8, Q10, 11, 10, 11, then 13. So he uh, did not review the ones that I have blanked out. Uh, when it comes to Bimal, he reviewed only 2. So he did not review this. Uh, 2, 4, or uh, 6, 2, 4, 6 through, 6 through 9 and then uh, 10, 11 he didn't review, 12 and 13. Okay, so this is what Bimal reviewed, Komal reviewed Q1 to Q5, so this first 5 she re uh, reviewed, then Q7, so that is Q7, then 7, 8, 9, so she didn't review 10 and she didn't review 13. So this is basically the ones that they didn't review at all. So now based on the fact that what the process is, what is required for approval, let us try to figure out who would have reviewed essentially. See if the, uh, unless like at, if uh, question 1 was not approved, uh, like was reviewed by A or B, then it must have been approved by Komal and if only one approval is enough, it must have come from a reviewer themselves, the question would have been uh, from a reviewer. So if it is Bimal's question, it is going to go to Komal and if she approves, it is going to get accepted. So the only way in which a question can be accepted with just Komal's uh, review is if it was made by Bimal. Because essentially if it is made by an external SME, then it would go first to Amal, then Bimal, etc. Since it didn't go to Amal and Bimal, that means it is internal and uh, it because it only went to Komal, it must have been from Bimal. Okay. Now let us take a look at 2. 2 went to all 3. So it, since it went to all 3, when is the only case in which it actually goes to all 3? See if one of the reviewers made the question, it cannot go to all 3 because a reviewer does not review their own question. So since 2 was reviewed by all 3, it must have been from a subject matter expert. Now if it was from an SME and it was rejected, then one of these 2 must have accepted and the other must have rejected and then Komal must have rejected it. That is the only way that you can actually get a reject as such. So if both of them accept, it is uh, uh, not seen by Komal. If both of them reject also, it is not seen by Komal. 
If one of them accepts, one of them rejects, then it depends on Komal's decision. And since the final decision is reject, Komal must have rejected this question. So, uh, basically one of these two approved the question, Komal rejected the question, this from, was from an external SMA. So, that is how I figure out the fate or the process for question 2. Similarly, just continue with all of them till you get a full table. For the third question, we see that Amal and Komal have uh, seen the question and Bimal has not seen it. See, if it was from an external reviewer, SME, it would have gone to uh, Bimal also before it went to Komal, which means that this must have been from Bimal. And if it is from Bimal and it went to Komal and Amal, it means that Komal would have rejected it and Amal would have accepted it. See, if Bimal makes a question, it first goes to Komal. If she accepts it, it gets accepted. If she rejects it, then it goes to Amal. And if Amal accepts it, then it gets accepted. So, if, since the final decision is accept, Amal must have accepted the question and Komal would have rejected the question and Bimal would have made the question. Now, in this case, all three have reviewed the question, which means that it is from an external party. And since all three have reviewed the question, one of these two must have rejected it, the other would have accepted it and finally Komal would have accepted it as a tiebreaker. So, Komal accepted it which is why the final result is accept. Now, in this case, we have again like question 1, we have only Komal reviewing and it is accepted which means that this must have been reviewed by Komal, accepted by Komal and made by Mimal. That is the only way you can have a approval based on only Komal's approval which is if the author is Bimal and Komal is the first in uh, line to uh, uh, check it. Now, here we have Amal and Bimal checking the question. Komal has not reviewed the question and it is uh, rejected. Now, what can essentially happen over here? This basically means there are two possibilities. If this is from an external SME, then both of them rejected it and what happened because it was from an external SME, both of them rejected it. So, Komal never saw it or it is from Komal herself. Now, once Komal makes it, it first goes to Amal for approval and if uh, first, if uh, Amal rejects it, then Bimal also has to check it and if Bimal also rejects it, then it is uh, discarded. So, both of them would have uh, not approved this question, but it could have come from an SME or from Komal. So, we can infer that this is either SME or Komal as such. Now, consider the seventh question. This was reviewed by Bimal and Komal, but not an Amal. So, that means that Amal should have been the author of it. If it was an external SME, Amal would have been the first one to review. So, this means that this particular question is from Amal. If it is from Amal, then it is first reviewed by Bimal. If Bimal okays it, it does not go to Komal, which means that Bimal rejected it. And since the overall result is accepted, Komal must have accepted this given question. Now, consider eighth question. All three have reviewed it, which means that this must be from an SME. Uh, if this is from an SME and the overall uh, result is accept, then this means that one of these two rejected or accepted and then finally Komal accepted. Uh, now consider question 9, Amal has not seen the question, Bimal and Komal have seen the question. That means that Amal must have been the author, otherwise if it was an external party, uh, he would have been the first to see. This, this means that it was uh, uh, created by Amal. Since the result is rejected, both of these must have rejected. That is the only way that the question will not be selected as such. Now, consider 10th question. 10th question uh, is selected and only Amal sees it. If only Amal sees it, that means that this is from one of the reviewers and Amal would be the first in line to see it. So, this means that this must come from Komal and Amal would be the first person to see it and if he gives his approval, it is accepted. So, he must have given his approval and nobody else saw it and it was accepted. Now, consider the 11th question. Bimal has not seen the question. Amal and Komal have seen the question, which means that Bimal must be the author. See, if it is an external party, Amal and Bimal must see the question. So, if Bimal is not seeing the question, he is the author of it. So, that means that 11th question was written by Bimal. If Bimal uh, writes a question and it goes first, it will go to Komal. If she accepts it, it will not go to Amal. So, she must have rejected it. And since the end result is also rejected as such, so Amal would have also rejected the question. Now, consider 12th question, Amal has not seen it, so Amal is the author, which means that Bimal and Komal saw it, both must have rejected it, which is why the end result is reject. Now, consider the last one where Amal and Bimal have uh, given the uh, uh, result as such. In this case, uh, you have basically two possibilities, either that this was by an SME or it was by Komal. 
in both cases you would have this particular combination with with only amal and bimal reviewing if it was by an sme and komal has not seen it it means that both of them accepted or if it was by komal then it would mean that it was rejected by amal but accepted by bimal this is the only way in which you can actually get a accept as such so that means what is the end result you have this possible uh, way in which a particular question could have fared and we know who was the author for each of these questions like the possibilities and we know what would have been the order of accept or reject based on that so now let us take a look at the questions based on this how many questions were definitely created by amal so of this uh 1 2 3 that is question 7 question 9 and question 12 were definitely created by amal so the right answer to this is 3 now consider the second question how many were definitely created by komal so there were some which are basically either ko sme or komal so we cannot consider them because we need definitely by komal so definitely by komal is this one here so one was definitely created by komal so that would be a uh, question 10 so that is answer is one one question was definitely created by komal the third question is how many questions are definitely created by sme so that would be one two three yeah three questions were definitely created by sme so the answer to this particular one is three three questions are definitely created by sme Now let us consider the fourth question how many questions were definitely disapproved by bimal so definitely disapproved so we have 1 2 3 4 four were definitely disapproved by bimal uh, there were four rejects there are some which are like tick or cross so we don't know the actual status he might have approved them might have disapproved them but four he definitely disapproved so the right answer to this is option b 4 The fifth question is the approval ratio of a reviewer is the ratio of the number of questions she approved to the number of questions she reviewed which option best describes amal's approval ratio so in this case let us see amal's uh, rates as such so this is like say yes no maybe okay maybe is when you have yes or no kind of thing so this is maybe one yes one maybe two uh, so let's first count the yeses one two yeses How many knows? One, two knows. How many maybes? One, two, three, four maybes. So four maybes. This is also maybe only because uh, if it was an SME, then he approved. If it was uh, Komal who was author, he rejected. So there are a total of eight questions he reviewed. Two yeses, two knows, and four maybes. So basically, what would be his approval ratio? See, if, if all of these are basically disapprovals, then that would mean that he approved two out of eight. and all if all of these maybes were actually approvals then he approved 6 out of 8 okay so what would his approval ratio be in that case 2 out of 8 is 1 by 4 or 0.25 and 6 out of 8 is 3 by 4 or 75% so the approval rate should be between 25% and 75% which is uh, over here it is not either or it is somewhere in between so basically if he approves instead of say 2 or 6 say out of this uh, four say if he approves two and rejects two then his approval ratio is 0.5 if he uh, approves three and rejects one then his approval ratio is between some uh, like basically 5 by 8 or something like that so it's not exactly either 20.25 and either or 0.75 it is between 0.25 and 0.75 so lies between 0.25 and 0.75 the so the correct option to choose is option d it can be even 0.75 if he approves all the maybe decisions then uh, it will be 6 out of 8 which is 0.75 so now let us take a look at the last question how many questions created by amal or bimal were disapproved by at least one of the other reviewers so let us take a look at that has to be created by amal or bimal and has to be disapproved by one of the other reviewers so let us take a look at that bimal but not disapproved by any reviewer this is by bimal and disapproved by komal so yes one bimal and not disapproved by anyone amal and disapproved by one person so yes 
uh, Amal and disapproved by one person, so yes, and Bimal and disapproved by one person, so yes, Amal and disapproved, yes. Uh, so, Amal and Bimal, so there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 such questions. So, the correct answer is option C, 5. So, as you can see, once we had this table, it became fairly trivial as such. We just had to figure out how many possibilities are there as such. And we had to go question by question. So, initial layout or initial uh, uh, calculation would have taken some time. But other than that, after the table is done, it became easy to calculate. So, this is basically how you should solve questions of this type. Try to make a table, tabulate all your results, be methodical in how you approach questions like this and you will definitely answer them in as little time as possible. So, this is how you solve this particular question. Please keep practicing from the study room. Thank you for tuning in. Google search Kraku CMAT mock test series. Click on the link. You can attempt one free mock and five paid mocks in the actual exam interface. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis, percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance.